Welcome to the Bud's Beer Blurb Podcast. You can catch all of our episodes on Bud's blog site at budsbeerblurb.com. We can be heard on Spotify, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, YouTube, and many other podcast sites. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Just search at Bud's Beer Blurb. Be sure to like and follow us while you're there. Hello everyone, I'm Bud Esty, and I want to welcome you to episode number nine of Bud's Beer Blurb, the podcast. I want to start this episode off by explaining a few things that are going on with the podcast itself. We are still in the development stage of this podcast. At first, we were having all kinds of technical difficulties, content issues, and just the flow of the episodes, meaning we were still discovering who we are. I have a general idea of how I want to see this podcast go, but having trouble getting it to go there. So interviews were beginning to pile up a bit. I had recorded a few guests, but the recordings were not worthy of my guests. The sound quality has been a stumbling block for me. Also, to be honest, I hate editing audio. (laughs) It's just so boring, and my ADHD cannot handle being bored. Even though all the technical issues have not been completely ironed out, we have been doing better with the recordings. Which brings me to our next issue. Too many guests. (laughs) Right? Big problem. I'm not sure what happened, but suddenly my calendar filled up fast. We have been out recording interviews, but not editing them fast enough. So my apologies to those guests who have been waiting to hear their segments. I promise you they're on their way. Now we are at a place where we're trying to plow through the editing and get these interviews out there. I want to create a consistent posting schedule so that you, the listener, will know when to look for the next episode's release. So now you know what we've been doing here and what we're striving to do. And I appreciate each and every guest and everyone involved in the production of this podcast. And I thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. Now, on with the show. I am in the studio today with Jessica Holman and Michaela Roy, and they represent Safe Bar. And I'm going to let them explain the Connecticut chapter of Safe Bar. But first, I want to start out by saying I owe these ladies an apology. This is their second visit here, and the first visit went great. We had a great session, and then I lost the file to the recording. <laughs> yeah, you snicker and chuckle now, but <laughs> but they they rolled with it, and they have smile on their faces, great attitudes right now, and they're all forgiving, and I appreciate that, ladies. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for having us. Why don't we talk about Safe Bar and the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. So, I am the Prevention and Communications Manager at the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence, Mm -hmm. and we are coordinating the statewide chapter of an initiative called Safe Bars. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michaela Roy. I'm happy to be here. I'm a bar manager in West Hartford at Union Kitchen and a hospitality partner with the Connecticut chapter of Safe Bars here with Jess. Okay. So this has got to be keeping you busy, right? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So tell us about what your mission is. Yeah. So the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence broadly as an organization works to prevent sexual violence and foster a network of support for folks that experience harm. And Safe Bars is one of our prevention initiatives that really partners with the hospitality industry to stop sexual aggression and other forms of violence in alcohol serving spaces. Okay. So to get into this, what, I mean, did you have to have a certain uh, educational background for this? That's a great question. There's really no linear path towards violence prevention or advocacy as a career, Mm -hmm. but I actually was a student activist at Southern Connecticut State University and did a bunch of active bystander presentations and trainings for students, Mm -hmm. and that is really what launched me into this field as a career. So I'm able to still be doing bystander intervention, but now in a slightly different venue with a slightly different audience. Okay. Uh, Michaela, what about you? How did I get into it? Yeah. Kind of through personal experience. Just went through a traumatic experience of my own, dealing within the hospitality industry, and realized that 
something needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, in the position that I'm in with the people I know within the industry, I realize I can be a part of that change and, and try and help it. Okay. So, and you know, I'm a beer blogger, so I'm in breweries mostly, but this isn't just about bars and breweries, is it? No, this is really about like shifting the culture and shifting the conversation. So even though it's called safe bars and we focus on organizations or spaces that serve alcohol, we also can use these same sets of skills in restaurants, cafes, bakeries, other forms of hospitality industry. But mm -hmm. we really focus on violence in alcohol serving spaces in this initiative because alcohol can so easily be weaponized right. as a way to cause sexual harm to another person or be used as camouflage to like shrink responsibility and say, mm -hmm. I was just so drunk, I don't know what happened. Yeah, and that's unacceptable. Absolutely. That's unacceptable. First of all, don't get that drunk, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Do you have to like find places to bring your organization in or are they looking for you? How, how do you get into an establishment? We are working kind of to do two things concurrently. As we launch the project statewide, we are opening it up to anyone who works in the industry. And actually on July 29th, we'll be at Union Kitchen mm -hmm. doing a skill building session. So just offering the training to anyone who works in the industry and is interested mm -hmm. in learning how to be an active bystander. We also, after we do some of those trainings, are going to be certifying safe bars. So at businesses where 66% of the front of house staff are trained with active bystander skills, they will earn a window decal and an opportunity to be promoted as a safe bar or an industry, or, sorry, a business that has committed to stopping sexual aggression and supporting folks who might experience harm. Interesting. You, you, you handed me a, a folder, which mm -hmm. was extremely colorful and efficient. I love that. Can you go over some of this with me, though? Yeah. I mean, I think Safe Bars works to challenge a culture where sexual harassment is tolerated. So we really want to kind of break down the idea that alcohol causes sexual violence mm -hmm. and make sure that everyone who works in the industry knows that people cause sexual harm yes. and alcohol can be weaponized. Right. So people often think that, you know, like we hear victim blaming questions around how much were you drinking or what did you wear? And Safe Bars really works to challenge that and say someone could be extremely intoxicated, not wearing any clothes, and they still deserve our respect, right? So yeah. how do we create an environment where everyone who works at the bar or the vast majority of people are ready to intervene if they see someone being sexually aggressive or just harmful in another way? Right. Why bystanders? So you're talking about you're, you're training just people who frequent any of these venues, and you're training them to look for things. What, what do you train them to do? We focus on bystander intervention skills and we're training the folks that work at the bar. Mm -hmm. And we really want those skills to be used, whether something is happening between two guests, between two staff members, or if a staff member is being harmful toward a guest, or if a guest is being harmful towards a staff member. The safe bars training really kind of covers all of those dynamics. And as you can imagine, right, there's different power dynamics involved, oh, yeah. particularly when there's tips at play and even within different kind of powers and hierarchy within like staff on staff and institutions yeah because it's not just about staff watching patrons but it's also staff and staff and mm -hmm. patrons on staff and staff on patrons yeah exactly i think it's important too to let people know that like to give them the tools to realize that there may be things going on that are not okay if that wasn't presented to them they wouldn't have known otherwise right because a lot of things within I'm speaking from my own experience in bars and restaurants get brushed under the rug. It's like, oh, that's just the industry. Like, <laughs> let's, yeah. no, it's no. not. Let's stop saying that. We offer a two and a half hour training and we really start that training by kind of talking about what even unwanted sexual attention or sexual aggression looks like. Mm -hmm. And we put them on a range of annoying behaviors, which we can all kind of identify mm -hmm. to behaviors that are dangerous or behaviors that are life threatening. And then as a group, we kind of collectively explore what would it look like to intervene in those situations and what's the safest, most respectful and healthiest way to intervene. So we're offering several different strategies to do something if you see something harmful, mm -hmm. as well as identifying like when might you need to do something? Because to Michaela's point, a lot of these actions, a lot of these behaviors have been normalized or are normalized. Right. Way. Let's say you have a bar mm -hmm. and the bar is, wants to be certified as a safe bar, but they're old school. They got bouncers. Are you training these bouncers to not be aggressive or are you training them to 
just go ahead and do your job. <laughs> well, I think bouncers are actually like a really important piece of the equation for yeah. us, right? So mm-hmm. not every business is going to have bouncers or like formal security in place. Correct. But one of the strategies that we use is actually delegating responsibility to someone else. Yes. So for businesses that have those people on site, they're kind of a default. Like we can delegate to this person if something is escalating. So when it comes to training, are you going into these venues or do people come to you? We're doing a little bit of both. Really? Yeah. And I think it's one thing that's really important to know too, is that the training is free. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That is very good. There's no cost except for covering the cost of having your employees go to this training. Okay. But there's no cost to bring us in to do this training. And more often than not, we'll most likely be going into their establishments to do the training, but we're also happy to accommodate and find spaces where we, we can meet them in those spots too. I think that's interesting. You, I think it's a great idea to go into the venue because then you're seeing what you're dealing with. And I would tend to think that each venue would have its own little you know, thumbprint about it and you could evaluate that, correct? Absolutely. So one of the things we're doing to kind of help folks understand what this training is and why it's offered is opening it to the general public. And in the next few months, we'll move towards certifying different safe bars. And so as we move towards certifying safe bars, we're going to build out a map of all of the businesses that have been trained, put them on our webpage, and really highlight the fact that they've agreed to be a part of this cultural shift. Mm -hmm. And as we are certifying folks, we're also making sure that they're aware of all of the resources in their community. And the training is always going to be facilitated by a hospitality partner. So that's why we're really lucky to have Michaela here kind of lending that perspective and discussing her experiences Mm -hmm. today, Mm -hmm. as well as someone who represents the local member center that provides support to survivors. It's interesting. I'm seeing our house rules. Yeah, I should put my glasses on. But our house, (laughs) our rules. What does that mean to you guys? These are kind of example policies that the International Organization of Safe Bars has put out. And these are kind of expectations that we would share with business owners, um, folks that are in leadership positions to talk about the type of culture we're working to build. So you'll see in bold, we believe in affirmative consent. Mm -hmm. Without a yes, it's a no. So oftentimes we hear no means no, and we want that to be heard and understood. But we also want to shift that culture to say only yes means yes. Mm -hmm. And how do we empower folks in these spaces that have the capacity to intervene to understand what that looks like and kind of what dynamics might be at play. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things we know in the sexual violence world is that disproportionately people cause harm to people that they already know. Yeah. And that's the sad part, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole situation of sexual violence is extremely terrifying, but to have a family member or a friend or, you know, something like that, that's, that's just completely uncalled for. I wish I could understand it better. Again, as a retired correction officer, I dealt with a lot of personalities and predators are difficult personalities to deal with. They really are. People who cause harm are really all around us. And oftentimes we hear people say like, oh, well, I know when someone's being creepy or like, I would say something if someone was coming to like every person sitting at the bar. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we really do is like, yes, absolutely. We want you to pick up on that. But Mm -hmm. also what are some more like nuanced signals or things that we might be looking for to say, even if they came together, is this person safe? Is this person having a good experience? Mm -hmm. And if they are not safe or not having a good experience, how might we get involved in a way that gives them choice or gives them freedom to kind of move through that? Yeah. So what Jess is saying, like more often than not, an individual can identify someone that's being creepy or, you know, acting in these ways that is is not safe for Mm -hmm. others. But when you come to that situation where like it's time to say something or it's time to do something we are here to give you those tools to like know what to do and to feel confident doing it right and that's that's probably the most important key to this because in a lot of these situations people freeze Mm -hmm. you know the victim will freeze and not will know what to do oh yeah and you're providing with tools that coping and also mechanical tools to to take care of the situation that that is wonderful we often hear like fight or flight as trauma responses Mm -hmm. and i think one of the things we know to be true is that freeze is just as real and just as valid Mm -hmm. and it's a way of our bodies just kind of keeping us safe in that moment and keeping us going and what we hear oftentimes from folks that freeze in an uncomfortable situation is that they really feel a responsibility that they didn't say no. Mm -hmm. And so going back to that affirmative consent standard, it's like, well, you also didn't say yes and you didn't feel safe and you didn't, nothing that you did or said or wore caused someone else to be harmful to you. Mm -hmm. 
So we're definitely wanting folks to be able to pick up on those nuanced signals. And also folks that work in the hospitality industry are already doing that. You are all experts at reading the room and kind of understanding who's had too much, where are people going, what's the dynamic. So it's really just kind of a new set of language and a new set of skills describing things that I think are pretty intuitive to folks that care for other people in the way that we do. Yeah, exactly. Here's an interesting question I have. Thus far, we've been talking about prevention. Mm -hmm. Do you have any services for victims? Yes. So the state of Connecticut across the state has nine member centers that are member centers of the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. They provide free confidential support and they provide services both to someone who's directly experienced harm, which we often hear as like a victim or survivor, Mm -hmm. and also friends or family members. So anyone who loves or supports someone who's experienced harm can also receive free and confidential support. Um, And that's really something that When we think about this initiative and the work that we're doing, people may not know that those services exist, but they also may not know that those services exist for people other than the primary person who experienced harm. So even as we're training folks, we're saying, like, if you intervene in a situation that hits too close to home, you're also welcome to call that hotline and process that experience with someone because sexual violence is a community level issue. It's Mm -hmm. not impacting a singular person. It's impacting all of us in different ways. Right. Because even the one victim that gets victimized, they bring that home to their family now. They may, yeah. And they may never tell them, but they're still probably. Right. And it can create problems in in a family, you know. So there's more than one victim to that also. Michaela. Yeah, I think part of the reason why I'm so passionate about my work with Safe Bars is because I never knew any of these things existed that just just talked about. Mm -hmm. When I went through my experience, I didn't know who to turn to. I tried going to the state, different avenues of the state, no help there. Mm -hmm. I went through other ways, no help there. If I had known something like this existed, you know, it would have helped my whole experience absolutely that's part of why i love doing this is to share all of that information that jess is involved with you know i'm proud of you from turning this around and turning it into a strength oh, rather yeah. than yeah. a crutch Thank of you. some sort you know and and i applaud you for that i applaud both of you for the work that you're doing this is extremely important that's why i was really hoping you'd come back out because <laughs> i want this message out there you know One of the things that I always like to think about is really like concepts of healing and safety and justice. So when we think about what it means to like work with a victim advocate after someone experiences harm, we're helping that person heal. We're helping that person find safety and justice might look different for everyone. For some people that might be engaging in a criminal justice system for other folks that might be just naming the person who caused harm to them. Mm -hmm. It's really not something that we can kind of prescribe or say this is just or unjust, but we really want folks who've experienced harm to define that for themselves and move through whatever process feels healing and safe and just to them. This makes me just think of a, a recent video I saw of, I think it was Miss America or one of these, these beauty pageants and the, whichever state Miss I think it was Massachusetts, maybe she, uh, it was her turn to speak and she spoke up and in the crowd was her abuser. So she didn't like name names or anything, but she was just like, I'm here to like spread awareness that this, all this stuff happens. Like my abuser is literally sitting in this audience now. Oh my goodness. I was like, the strength she has. Like I, can we swear? Yeah. Yeah. Go right out. I fuck with her. Like, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That, well, yeah, it's a podcast. Don't really need to <laughs> say whatever you need to say. So you have something here called Intervention Strategies, the five D's and an R. <laughs> what is that? One of the things that we really focus on in our training is these five D's and mm-hmm. then the R is responsiveness. Okay. And we really want folks, particularly folks that work in the industry, to know that People are sexually aggressive. Alcohol causes drunkness. Alcohol might cause hangovers, but Mm -hmm. people can weaponize alcohol. Mm -hmm. So the intervention that is natural to folks is like if someone's had too much to drink, we cut them off. And these are ways of intervening beyond alcohol, but like in harmful behaviors. So before you go into this in depth, I want to make sure this point is coming across because you say alcohol can be weaponized. This isn't just about somebody who is drunk and is hitting on somebody else. This is also about somebody who may be maintaining a sober mind, but utilizing alcohol to intoxicate someone to victimize them, correct? 
It can, yeah, it can be a bunch of things. So that would certainly be like a big one is someone who deliberately gets someone drunk to the point of incapacitation. So when we think about consent, we're really thinking about only yes means yes. Mm -hmm. And someone who's incapacitated by alcohol can't make a clear, freely given, informed right. choice to consent to something. And also we know that people who cause harm when both people are maybe intoxicated or mm -hmm. incapacitated will say like, I'm so drunk, I don't even know what happened. Right. And kind of use that alcohol to be like, well, whatever happened was just like a silly drunk experience or like a such a drunk experience rather than saying perhaps you weren't in a position to consent or I wasn't in a position to consent or that was not healthy. Mm -hmm. So it really can both be used to incapacitate another person, but also to like camouflage responsibility. Right. And at the end of the day, we know that like if someone is drunk at home alone, the consequence of drinking is drunkness. Right. Maybe a hangover. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go with the D's. Yeah. A and the R. So the first D is being direct with either the target or the aggressor. For example, with the target, check in with them. Just say, you know, how's your night going? Who are you here with? Things like that. Uh, you could also be direct with the aggressor themselves and mm -hmm. say, and you know, the guest said they're not interested. We don't do that here at this establishment type of things like that. Mm -hmm. Then you could, if you know, if you see that that's not working, there's also the distract method. Okay. So with the target, make up some situation that distracts them to think about something else or moves them away from that aggressor. So like, oh, you know, I totally forgot to close your tab earlier. Can you come over here and just help me finish this out? Interesting. Move yeah. them closer to the, the POS system, whatever. Or you could distract the aggressor and say, you know, same thing and something wrong with your credit card. Can you move over here and help me process that? Mm -hmm. That way, giving the target a way to get out of it. Right. Yeah. Just diffusing that situation even for a moment. And like one of the things we're not talking about them as separate things, but they can also be used together. Right. So like you might distract someone and bring them over to you and then directly say like that person seems really uncomfortable. You need to leave them alone. Or it, it seems like that person might be making you uncomfortable. How's everything going? Okay. Yeah. And so then we're on to delegate. Yeah, so you could delegate with the target or the aggressor. So it's funny because as someone that works behind the bar, we do this all the time. We, we might have, you know, the chatty regular that comes in. Susie, the chatty regular, mm -hmm. comes in. And we love talking to her, but today we're just not feeling it. Okay. So we know to ways to delegate that conversation to either the customer next to them or mm -hmm. The coworker that's working oh, wow. with us to, you know, be like, tie them into some conversation to have them chat about, chat with that person instead of me. Like, you just might not be feeling it that day. But we could use that to, if we see that on the target or the aggressor, to, like, delegate them to a okay. different person within the establishment. So is that like uh, on How I Met Your Mother, who Barney used to say, hey, have you met my friend Ted? Yeah, that, exactly. is <laughs> that is a delegate. That is a distraction. And, like... One of the things that's interesting is like we all show up differently in spaces. So like mm -hmm. even the three of us, we could say like, hey, but could you go talk to that guy? Like he's really tall and just like would respond differently to you than he might to me. Right. So we can also kind of think about that element of how we show up because, mm -hmm. yeah, there might be someone who gets completely overwhelmed and frustrated with a chatty regular and just abandons the situation. But there also might be someone who would respect you being like, what's going on over here? Right. Yeah, I have to do this all the time. Because I'm the one of, well, now I'm not, but I used to be the only female behind my bar. There's two other guys. And there were so many situations where I'd be like, guys, one of you has to handle this. Like, mm -hmm. one of you has to talk to this customer. Mm -hmm. Not that it was a negative situation, but you could just tell that that right. person would communicate better with the other sex. Right. And I was like, the, I can give you a prime example of that too. In the prison system, there would be certain inmates. If I approached an inmate, there would be nothing but aggression and hostility. But if I sent a female officer, that in, same in, they would respond with, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, Cause yeah. all of a sudden, oh, here's mom talking to me type of thing or, you know, so that whatever it triggered, but yeah. so yeah, it's in individual cases, of course. And I think also just like, while we're chatting about this, it's important to highlight, like, we often think of sexual violence and we think that like women are experiencing it, but like, it's really important to keep in mind that women can cause harm. Women can experience harm. Men can mm -hmm. cause harm and experience harm. And like, folks that are gender non-conforming or non-binary disproportionately experience harm, oh, yeah. as well as folks who are trans disproportionately mm -hmm. experience harm. So it's really interesting when we have this conversation and we think about delegating, like who we delegate to is reflecting 
kind of who has power in those situations and who might be mm-hmm. heard or respected differently mm-hmm. when someone's being aggressive. Okay. So what's our next date? Then we go into documenting the situation. Sometimes it's safe to directly intervene. Sometimes it's safe to create a distraction. Other times it might not be safe to directly intervene or to be like in that situation. Mm -hmm. So particularly if folks have security cameras, it's valuable and beneficial to just make note of like at 1210, this happened. It was captured in this area so that they can check in with management. We never want folks to be like, documenting it in a way that's like live streaming it or putting it out but just even being able to make a note to refer back to can be really valuable and that kind of relates to delay so we want folks that work in the industry to know kind of how they could document or what it could look like to document an incident Mm -hmm. and we also want them to know it's never too late to get involved so if someone documents something at midnight the night before and then the next day at work is able to pop over and say like Hey, Michaela, I saw something went down at like 1215. It didn't really sit well with me. Like, how are you feeling? How Mm -hmm. did you experience that? That's really valuable because they now can point back to a time and date stamp and say, this is what we were looking at. On the topic of like the whole delay D, I, when coming on to Union Kitchen, I've never really made a big deal of like, you know, a title with my job or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I definitely wanted to have business cards with my name on them and my position and my direct contact because of situations like this where I could give my business card to the target Mm -hmm. and say, listen, I know this is, you might not want to talk about this now, but here's my card in case you ever want to. And that works in delay? Can you expound on that just a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I... And... (laughs) I think that one of the things that's really valuable about a delayed response is that you're saying, like, I saw what happened to you. I understand what happened to you. It's not too late to say something. So we think about healing and safety and justice. Like, healing is a process. Mm -hmm. Safety is something that can change really, like, minute to minute. Mm -hmm. So it can be really empowering and validating to have someone else say, like, hey, I saw what happened and that was unacceptable. How are you feeling? Do you want support? And either be able to like offer that support if you're in a space to do that or be able to refer someone back to a member center for free confidential support with an advocate. This one hits hardest for me because like I was saying with my experience, I didn't know I was going through it until Mm -hmm. afterwards. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's when like the delay, it's like when you have time to finally reflect on what you went through, Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that person checking in with me like saw it. Right. That person saw something was not okay. And that validates the voice of the question of like, was that normal? Did anyone see that? Was Mm -hmm. that a big deal? Perfect. That's what I was looking for. Excellent. All right. So then R, what's what's up with that R? (laughs) Well, it's actually like so important and kind of links to all of them because it's really about how we respond when someone tells us what they want. There's so many ways of responding, right? It could be the direct intervention. It could be delegating responsibility to someone else. But if someone tells us like, hey, I really don't want anything to happen. I just want a quiet ride home. Mm -hmm. It's not our right to say, actually, we're going to turn the lights on. We're going to turn the music off. We're going to call this person out, right? Like, responsiveness is doing what that person is asking you to do and respecting that they're the expert in that thing. Okay. So for like a delayed response, for example, you could offer someone resources and tell them, you know, there's support available and there's support groups available and here are some ways to get involved. If that's not something that that person wants, we're not going to say they're doing anything wrong by not accepting those resources because they could take them a month from now or a mm-hmm. year from now or three years from now mm-hmm. and still be on a pathway towards healing. But mm-hmm. we want to respond to kind of where are they in that moment and what do they need? Yeah. And how are they processing? I think a lot of people are familiar with the love languages yes. in relationships. I'm sure I actually, I actually am. Yeah. <laughs> people have taken those tests, whatever, to find yeah, out what they I'm are. I'm words of affirmation. Yeah, so, me know. too. <laughs> so, you guys are both doing a good job. There you go. I feel like this is very similar to that. Like, mm-hmm. no one person is the same. Everyone's right. going to, you know, accept things and do things differently. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, you know, our job to, to figure out how this person receives it. Okay. Well, you guys just launched a, a website, didn't you? We just launched a website called 
and sexualviolencect.org slash safe bars. And that webpage has all of the outreach information, all of the sample policies that we discussed today, Mm -hmm. and an option to request a training. We also have some upcoming events that are open to anyone in the hospitality industry. So Mm -hmm. folks can look at that webpage and sign up if they're available so that they can experience the training, right? Like, sounds really formal. It might sound really intense. Mm -hmm. But once you're in that room and you're experiencing the training, it's really meant for folks that work in this industry and meant to be fun and empowering and really not a super heavy experience. Yeah. And that's what like my role in the other hospitality roles is to kind of like be that translator in the room, Mm -hmm. like Jess and the other um, people with her organization, they're, they're aware and they know how to, you know, spot, they might spot someone in the audience doing something that is, is they clearly understand is making them uncomfortable and they might know to, okay, keep an eye on that person. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't notice things like that Mm -hmm. being in hospitality, but I know how to translate. Like we always reference this being like, okay, it's the walk-in versus the refrigerator. It's like (laughs) huge (laughs) difference, (laughs) but but people outside of hospitality wouldn't know that. Well, here's what I'm going to do, ladies. Uh, I'm going to take a link to your website and put it on my link tree. So at the time of hearing this folks, you can go to my Instagram, hit my link tree and there'll be a link guiding you right to this website. Thank you so much. Perfect. Oh, it's that important, I believe, in what you guys are doing. And thank you so much for coming on the show again. <laughs> coming all the way out here. <laughs> I really appreciate it, but I, I, I know that this is going to be me. So, again, thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you for you having so us. For having us. Okay, so Bud and Nick are here in the studio, and we have a beer review for you. This one comes from the Burlington Beer Company. Uh, BBCO is what they go by. And this one's called Blue Dream. Have you ever heard of Blue Dream before? Um, I've heard it's a cannabis, isn't it? Yeah. So Blue Dream is made with uh, terpenes that taste like the Blue Dream cannabis strain. So uh, let's do a little tutorial on that. This is a Hops 101 Special Edition. In this episode, we will be looking at Blue Dream Terpenes. Let's deep dive into this product and see exactly what it is. By the way, all the information I am about to unleash on your brain has been graciously provided to me by Trevor Hill of ExtractConsultants.com. Thanks for your help, Trevor. Let's start by defining what a terpene is. Terpenes are molecules called hydrocarbons, which are produced by plants, animals, and even fungus. In plants, these aromatic molecules are found in essential oils, and they combine to create each plant's unique scent and flavor profile. The Blue Dream Terpene flavor profile is dominated by alpha-pinene, beta-pinene, D-limonene with linalool, and beta caryophyllene giving it that familiar dank earthy aroma then they finish off with powerful notes of floral and piney citrus these terpenes were specifically designed to work directly with beer spirits and cocktails they are water soluble and were designed to bring creative flavor profiles to your beverages although created to taste much like the blue dream cannabis strain this product does not contain any thc cbd or any other active cannabinoids Even though this product is not a hop, we thought it appropriate to present it to you here on Hops 101. I'm Bud. Thanks for listening. So, that's what Blue Dream Terpenes are, and I think uh, it just comes down to you and I giving this stuff a taste. What do you think? Sounds good to me. Now, this is what is the percentage on this? It's 8, correct? Yes. I'm going to have to take a quick peek at the can here uh which is really good and wet here (laughs) but yes this is a got an abv of eight percent and this is a uh double ipa with the blue dream terpenes that we're gonna say if i remember correctly that's the only thing in this right um yeah it's not like they hopped it they didn't have to because of the hops that are in the terpene and uh the flavor well i i've i've actually had this before and the flavor is amazing so why don't we uh, see what the nose says? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Noise. Mmm, sweet. Yeah, I, I definitely smell some tart in there as well. Mm. Sweet tart. Did you just call me sweetheart? I could. Oh, you usually do. Mmm, <laughs> 
that's sweet. I got some definitely some melon, some papaya in there. Oh, yeah, the papaya is definitely one of the things I smell most. Okay, uh, yeah, I it's really prevalent. It's nice though, some uh, nice easygoing citrus in there. It's, it's always smells delicious, huh? Absolutely. Well, all right, let's uh, give it a taste. Mm. Slightly dank. Not but, not too bad. It goes away almost instantly. It sounds like, like the danks that sit and hang out in your mouth for a while. Yeah. Comes and it goes pretty quickly. It's sweet, though. And that papaya and the flavor really, oh, it's beautiful. But it has that distinct cannabis flavor about it also. Well, I'll, I'll get made fun of for this. That's not a, something I'm familiar with. Yeah. It's something I'm... Slight, slightly familiar with. <laughs> oh, so anyway, my package store guy, <laughs> where I bought this was um, Amazing Grapes, Wines and Spirits in Stores, Connecticut. And my guy behind the counter, his name is Eric. Uh, I love Eric. He's a great guy. And when I, one day I walked into the store and he saw me and he got all excited. And he's like, bud, 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 come here. Check this out. And he brought me to Blue Dream. And he said, it's made with terpenes, man. It's made with uh, cannabis. And I was like, uh, wow, okay, but it has no THC in it? Mm, let me investigate this. But he was all excited about it. He says it tastes just like his most favorite strain. <laughs> like Zoink <like> Scoop. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what are you, uh, what are you picking up in, in the, the taste? Tart that I smell, I do not taste at all. Right. The sweetness is not overwhelming, but it does linger, but mm -hmm. in a good way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not crazy about sweet, so it's not offensive to me with mm -hmm. this. Okay. Papaya, hundred percent. I can taste that. Yeah, oh, that, that's really definitely tasty. the main the main note here. It's beautiful. So, I'll start this one uh, with this. Uh, I give it a four and a quarter. I'm actually at three and three quarters. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. You getting tough, kid? It's, it, <laughs> it, it's good, but it's not doing it for me. Really? See, and that's palate perception. And, you know, I know that there's times when you and I do a rating on a beer and people will look at us and go, you're idiots. Uh, <laughs> because their palate likes dank well, or... Yeah, that's the beauty of this. Exactly. Or as I sip a West Coast, and like, you disgusting, you bastard. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just not a big fan of the West Coast, as everybody knows. Um, but, yeah, I think... I think we're both being very fair. Um, you're saying it's not standing out beyond other IPAs. No, it's it's good. Don't get me wrong. D obviously, that's that's still a good rating. Yep, yep. But it doesn't stand out too much to too me. Too much. Okay. Well, there you have it. Blue Dream. You know what terpenes are now in that industry, and you have the scoop on BBCO's Blue Dreams Double IPA. This was a bit of a quicker episode, but that's okay. I have a lot of guests that I have to put out as quickly as possible. A lot of episodes I want to put out as quickly as possible to get myself caught back up. Referring back to the beginning of the episode. <laughs> Once again, I want to thank Jess and Michaela for coming all the way back out for a second time. And for giving us all that great information about the Connecticut Alliance Against Sexual Violence. And Trevor Hill from ExtractConsultants.com. Thank you for all the info you sent to me. Well, I guess that wraps things up for this episode. Once again, thank you for listening. And until next time, I'm Bud from Bud's Beer Blurb. I'll be tipping one back for you.